Welcome to the Gabe Gallucci Golf Show. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Gabe Gallucci Golf Show. Today, I have a very special guest for you, Adam Fine, aka not a scratch golfer. I've been following this guy's YouTube videos for a while. He has a great story about his journey into golf. His game is so fun to watch. His attitude towards the game is awesome. And I think he brings a, a lighter, fun, and very approachable side to the game. And I think, you know, a lot of you that follow my journey, I, I am a bit extreme. But what I love about watching his content is it really actually scales back to the bare bones that are applicable to actually everybody. And I think the way he approaches it is so valuable. There's so many lessons to be had in there, and I've been looking forward to having this conversation. So without further ado, Brother Adam, welcome to the podcast. Great to be here, and thanks for all those kind words. <laughs> oh, dude, honestly, it's, uh, I love watching your stuff. I, I came across you, I want to say it's 2021. Um, this is when I was started to do my winters out in BC and I, I, it was between the algorithm and then I, I think at the same time, golf sidekick had posted your stuff or had mentioned. And I just remember watching your stuff and I was, and I was kind of a golf sidekick disciple as well of kind of that course management. And so it just kind of seemed to fit perfectly with where I was, was headspace wise. And, uh, so yeah, dude, your stuff's awesome. Again, I really appreciate it. It's funny you say that because, yeah, I myself consider myself a golf sidekick disciple. And the entire genesis of my channel really was, um, it was during the pandemic. And I came across, I think it was an old video at the time that uh, he had put up saying, here's how I make my YouTube videos. And it, it looked so much sort of less involved than I thought. I thought, wow, it's just a guy in his cell phone and some pretty easy editing software. And I thought, I want to document one of my rounds. And I never did it thinking you know, people like you, anyone in the golf world, I thought no one would, like, I didn't make it for consumption. I made it as just like a hobby exercise. And it's still wild to me to this day that it caught on, that people watch it. It's it, like every day I, I've joked before, like, I, and this is true. Like I often wake up uh, thinking like, today's the day I'm going to find out I'm actually just the butt of some internet joke. Like there's no re way people are watching this for what it is. Right. Right. And every day I feel a little more confident that I guess maybe I am contributing something to the golf community. And yeah, it's fun to do. Well, I think, I think there's a couple of factors that from, you know, from a, an outsider's perspective, watching your stuff, it's just, there's a, there's definitely a lightness to it. Like, you know, you, you, you take, you can tell there's joy in how you approach the game. Um, you take it seriously enough, but not to the point where it becomes detrimental to you. And I think for the people that are kind of in, uh, again, it depends on how you want to enjoy the game, but I think if you're of that kind of golf sidekick mindset, if you're a fan of his stuff, it kind of, you know, you provide some really good tips on just how to keep your game alive and keep it going. And I think that there's also some good value learning. So it's like entertainment, it's a good vibe, and then you also can pick up some good, some good tips along the way to kind of manage, your, manage yourself and not get too, uh, too out of hand. I appreciate it all. It means something I'm doing is working because that's what I'm trying to convey, so I'm glad to hear it's working. Yeah, uh, so... <laughs> First thing I want to jump into, because your story of, of golf is actually quite incredible. And I, I remember seeing your video of you kind of posting, because you had posted a bunch of videos, and then there, I, you know, I didn't realize there was, there was this kind of greater story to what the role golf plays to your life. And I think for those of us that are kind of this deep into the weeds into the game, uh, we all have that kind of like special feeling about what this game means to us and how, and how it involves us. But um, for yourself, I, I was just... Um, your story is incredible. So anyway, I just, if you would want to kind of share a bit of, of your journey and, and why this game has that much magnitude to you. Sure. Yeah. That, I think that's a good tee up for all of this. Cause I think, I, I guess maybe my backstory with why I got involved with golf and why I started golfing might also explain, uh, I guess like my attitude and my disposition towards it in terms of like you right. said, like treating it seriously, but not, you know, to my detriment and whatnot. Um, I'll try to kind of hit the high points of this and not get too lost in the weeds. But I, I guess the gist of it is, um, I guess for background, I, I always played pitch and putt, right? Like I love pitch and putt was like my association with golf. I grew up right. up the street from a pitch and putt, played it all the time and like really, really did love it. And I feel like I actually developed a good like wedge and putting game as a result, but I never played golf. Like 18 holes of golf to me was like, I don't do that. Like that's, that's a whole right. endeavor. And I guess it started, so I was diagnosed, and I'm 35 now, in my mid-20s, I was diagnosed uh, with this autoimmune liver disease, and 
it really started affecting my quality of life. Like I had no energy, like things were really going downhill health wise and there wasn't an end in sight. And then simultaneously, I was actually dating a girl who, um, she was on the opposite end of the spectrum. She was full of energy and like athlete, loved doing all these things. And she was like, we got to do something active together. And I was like, I don't have the energy to like hardly get out of bed. Yeah. And um, she said, why don't we play golf? We like golf. Like you like pitch and putt. And context, we're living in San Francisco, which is like maybe not a Mecca, but a haven of golf. Totally. And I thought, yeah, I could try that. Like, you know, get in the golf cart, go out in the park. Like this sounds my jam. And again, not like, so none of this was like, yeah, I'm going to get really into golf. It was like, I need to do something that I can do with my partner that'll like get me out of bed. And that's when, like, I caught the bug really hard, like, totally unexpectedly. Like, um, it was so nice. We were living in San Francisco, like I said. So as a resident of San Francisco, the local rate at Harding Park, maybe it was the Twilight rate, was like 40 bucks. Well, I was going to ask you this because I saw this in your video and I was like, you're like, oh, yeah, just ripping Twilight rounds at Harding Park. And I'm like, wow, like, what a what a treat these residency cards are. They really are, yeah. I, I'm going to say this. I'm going to admit it. I still maintain that resident card with the San Francisco Parks Board, even though I'm in Canada. Um, but yeah, it's, like you said, it was just like, oh my God, I get to go experience this world-class golf course. It's yeah. like, like for the cost of dinner. So it got caught the bug really, really hard. It was like playing and playing and playing until basically my health deteriorated to when I could no longer play. And then the liver episode culminated. I needed a liver transplant, which was no fun. <laughs> um but I, you know, I didn't know what I was going to do immediately afterwards. Like it really, it took me out of life for a year and a half, I'd say. And before like jumping back into work, I thought, you know what? I really like that golf thing. Like I'm going to do that again. Like let's just take a few months to appreciate my health and go out and do this thing I was starting to enjoy. And like the bug just developed even deeper. And again, just to back to my mindset, like I was and am still just like so appreciative. I just feel like, it's the nicest thing to be able to do. Like I, I talk a lot of, of, on my channel. I say I don't love practicing. I love being on the golf course, and it's true. Like right. being in a beautiful park, playing this like really mentally and physically challenging game. Like to me, I'm just so grateful to be able to do it. I was grateful to be able to do it in my spare time. And I already sort of mentioned what happened in terms of then starting the YouTube channel, which was totally just a labor of love while in that mode of, wow, I'm so appreciative to do this. And I guess it did dawn on me like, wow, I'm getting a little bit better at this despite not being that good at this. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, I kind of want to document this. And now the fact that uh, I don't make a great living, but I make a living doing this, like gratitude is the only kind of word I have, right? Like I just, <laughs> I can get in a bad mood on a golf course. Like it happens more often than never. Yeah. But, I, but I would say, like I'll, I'll say it this way. Last week we did a trip to Bandon Dunes and I was 90 something in my first round. And I was still like, just smiles. Like I just being able, sorry, this is a very long winded answer. No, but. no. I, I, listen, I, I'm Italian, buddy. We can, we can talk forever. <laughs> Trust me. I like, I keep it going. This is great. Yeah. I, I guess the gist of it is, um, yeah, my background uh, in falling in love with golf came from this place of being sick, finding something I could do, loving the environment of the golf course and the challenge of the game so much that like, that's what I've leaned into. And I've noticed like, I feel like everyone who plays golf like really has like can talk to you for hours about why they love golf. Right. And for me, it's like it's never been the pursuit of I got to get excellent at this. I need to develop great technique for this sport I respect. And full respect to people who do that because it's like mind-bogglingly difficult to get actually good at golf. Like, uh, but for me, it's just been like the joy of being there. And I feel even more lucky that that's kind of the part I get to share about on the channel. Like, yeah, I walk through, here's what I'm doing to try to enjoy it. But I try and in most videos to also point out like, okay, it's a double bogey. Like, look at where I am. Like, I'm just so grateful to be doing this. And I right. hope that I talk to a lot of people who, you know, they, their game devolves and they take a break from the game for years. And like, I hope that's never me because I hope I can enjoy golfing for the rest of my life, whether I'm a five handicap or a 50 handicap. Like <laughs> that's how I feel about the game. Yeah, totally. And, and, and I would say like, that's, that's what I think kind of circling back to what I was saying at the beginning. I think like for me, I find your stuff a great palate cleanser for my own. Uh, Cause I'm, I need to, I, I can't really do golf passively. Like I need to constantly grind the technique. Like that's what I selfishly need, but I, I do find sometimes I can move too far away from just being like, wow, I am outside. This is phenomenal. 
like life is great. And so I've, I've found a balance of, of trying to get back to there. Um, but that's, and that's where I find like watching your stuff is, is great. Cause it's just like, it's a lot m- more leaning into that side from the get go. And, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun to just enjoy. And I think also coming from Ontario, coming to BC now, what I do enjoy a lot is, uh, the landscapes of golf are so nice. Like mountains here, even cheap golf courses look expensive, <laughs> yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's. Uh, just having the mountains around, I have found to be very centering and almost like when you look up, you go, oh, you know, it's pretty great out here. Okay, whatever. We're just going to keep it moving. Do you have, because I, I feel like I have a few, like I totally, everything you just said resonates so much. And I think to myself, like I have a few places in golf for me that I'm like, there. these are my nirvana. I'm like, there doesn't need to be a place better than earth in heaven because to me it's like the monterey peninsula exists or right. do you have any of those like certain golf courses that you're just like i'm home like this is where i need to be <laughs> yeah you know it's it, so one of them is is in is in ontario it was a place called wind dance it was a greg norman course and i think uh it was the first course I ever shot under par at but it's it's a really cool course it's built into um an old mine oh cool and so it's weird you're actually for a lot of the course you're actually below the ground like you, it's, it's, it's weird how it's landscaped. And then, um, so that place, and honestly, it's, it's, it's the fond memories and the people I've played with there. So that one's that, um, cultus here in Chilliwack is kind of where my first place I played when I moved out here and like for a, for a cheap executive course, it, there's mountains everywhere, the driving range you look out. So it like, like that just gives me the vibe, right? Yeah. So, um, those two spots have, you know, there's something, there's an attachment there that, that there's that, but I, I still have to, I haven't really experienced all that, like the BC golf probably that you've seen where some of the courses out by where you're at that can be even more breathtaking. Yeah. I, I always, uh, tell, like I golf so much around the States too, and encounter so many Americans who have seen my channel and they're like, where are these spectacular places? And I'm like, it's a two hour flight away. <laughs> you can hop yeah. on a flight from California, come up here. And yeah, we're lucky in BC. There's, there's a lot of, I, this is me being a bit cynical. I, I sometimes say like, there's not enough, you know, uh, layouts here that as a layout are absolutely world-class, but yes. there's countless settings here that are world-class settings for golf, right? hundred percent. I, I agree. I think from an architecture standpoint, we don't, I think also part of it is because a lot of a lot of ho- courses are like just cut through trees, right? So they yeah. they kind of make these like, like I, it totally changed my game because I used to play this big draw back home because it, it was kind of wide open, and then out here I started to play in these like bullet cuts because I'm trying to fire it through the trees all the time. Um, so I think the land, you're right. Like layout wise, there aren't a ton of courses where I like love the course, but I love what I can see while I'm playing it, and it's cheaper, so it's kind of like. For this price, I'm getting this view. This feels more expensive, you know? Yeah, totally agree. What, what are your meccas? What about you? I mean, my my quick answer, like the Monterey Peninsula, right? So from Pebble Beach, obviously, right. the default answer. But for me, actually, I guess if I had to pick one, because my answer would be the whole Monterey Peninsula, but Spyglass Hill, um, it's, I've played it maybe four times now, I think. I'd have to look it up. It's really damn hard. I, I think I've broken 90 there once. And like I said, like I can get upset on a golf course. Like it's not the best day when I go out to a world-class place and shoot 95. It's like, ah, I could have done better. Right. But somehow, despite all of that, like whenever I go to Spyglass, I just, it is my mecca. Like it feels to me like, um, a lot of the holes feel very Augusta like, like you're so immersed in nature and there's pine straw if you're off the fairway and beautiful trees overhanging and great laid out holes. Um, but with, I, I'm a West Coaster, like I'm from Vancouver originally. And so it just feels to me like, wow, like put Augusta on the Pacific Ocean. Um, right. So yeah, I, I guess my default answer would probably be Spyglass. Uh, with nice. a close second being um, just like the entire Bandon Dunes Resort. Uh, because there, like I'm usually more of like, I don't care what the facility's like. I, I want a golf course. But Bandon Dunes, for anyone unaware, right? Like you've got five full-length courses that are every single one in the world top 100. And what's so nice is you can just show up and then everything is perfect. Like, they're shuttling you from course to course. Like, you don't have to think about anything once you get there other than 
I'm going to kick my feet up and enjoy golf until my feet hurt too much from walking and then I'm going to leave. Right. <laughs> so yeah, love banding as well. That's I, I, you know what? I haven't done an, I haven't done really any golf travel yet because I've been so focused on the building the technique side of things. Like that's been my ultimate pursuit. Mm-hmm. And, and I get, I do get a ton of joy from it. Like I love that thing, but I have definitely not, uh, I haven't, I haven't done enough like venturing around. So my plan over the next year or so is to kind of start moving out there and putting the game to the test on some of these better tracks, you know? Do you know where you want to go? Well, so funny enough, like a buddy of mine, uh, Dave, who co-hosts the podcast with me, um, he was like lived in Coronado and lived like lived in San Francisco. So he's, uh, he's had the residency card playing Tory Pines. So, oh, wow. you know, so he's told <laughs> me all the stories that like similar to you, you know, where it's like, yeah, he's like, Oh yeah, I've played Tory a million times on a Saturday for, you know, I'm 40 like, bucks probably. Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> that's just wild. You know, like I, like, like that's just such a, that's, that's crazy. Right. Um, so I, I, I still haven't done Bandon. Um, and then we have all these, like, so many courses in the interior here. Like, I haven't done Tobiano yet. Uh, Sagebrush, I don't know if you heard about that. It's like, like, there's that reopened last year. So there's so many, even those courses in the province that I have yet to kind of tackle. So it's like, I got a lot. But I just got a new car. So it's like, we're going to be, we're, I, I got I got plenty of miles to put on this thing. So that, that'll be the plan. Go to Sagebrush, man. It's, Sagebrush is spectacular. Yeah, um, it's great. They, they haven't been able to keep it friggin' up and running. It opened in 08. It's closed three times. They haven't been able to figure out the business model there because it's so remote and there's no, there's not even a clubhouse there, let alone like, yeah. you know. Um, but as a layout, it's just so, so, it, I think it's probably the coolest layout I've played in, in British Columbia. I think that's probably safe to say. Interesting. Uh, but yeah, conditioning and facilities lacking, but just getting, I mean, uh, you, you should see it. And you can combine it on a weekend trip with Tobiano. Be a great time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 like there's just so much good, and I think that's the interesting thing about being out here versus Ontario. Like Ontario, all the good courses are private. Mm-hmm. Here, there's just such a lack of private golf. It's it's actually quite interesting, but in a good way. Like ev- like all the good tracks are pretty accessible. I'm with you. I my one of my biggest pet peeves in golf is yeah, private golf and just kind of like the culture, like a snooty culture around golf. Yeah. Like to me, and again, I respect everyone's opinion on how like they enjoy the game, but to me, like I'm recreating in a park and I don't want, you know, like to me, the two rules, like I God, I wish in a future uh, existence, I, I'd have a golf course and there'd be two rules, respect the golf course and maintain pace of play because I can't imagine like, you know, you go to a private club and I'm a member of one and I do that because of T sheet access and whatever, but totally. Like going out onto the tee and having someone run up behind you and tell you like, you know, your socks aren't high enough or like you're not wearing a belt or your shirt's not tucked in. I think to myself, maybe this isn't one where I live and let live because my approach is you can wear whatever you want. If you're butt naked in front of me and you're maintaining pace, all good. And similarly, as long as I'm not affecting your ability to play around in this, again, I'm recreating in a park. If I'm not interfering with your ability to recreate in this park for four hours, I don't think you should have a problem with me. And there, a lot of private golf culture, I find, is just a lot of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's and that's a, a, in Ontario. Like, there's a, just a ton of that. Like, it's very, it's just very interesting. Where it, there's a lot of walled off golf courses. Yeah, you know, and they get priority of ranking out there because it's you know Toronto's the mecca of Canada. But listen, as a <laughs> as a as a former Toronto man, I can I can say you know it's it's pretty nice out here. Um, Going back to your game, kind of where you're at. And, and so you're a seven handicap right now? I, I actually, I posted like all the abandoned rounds. I'm like a 6.1 or 6.2 right okay. now. Yeah. Okay. So what's your, because it's interesting watching your stuff. It's, you know, your game is, is uh, it, it's, it's, it's very interesting because your putter can be like, like, I've seen you make an absurd amount of like 30 foot birdies. <laughs> Yeah, I make that sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like your putter's really good. You know, when the, like like you've you found a way to work with your swing, which I think is really cool. Like you talk a lot about like grinding to a point and you maintain certain fundamentals. And you talk about, you know, as long as I'm hitting this impact position, then like we're just gonna leave it here and go. And so maybe just kind of give an overview of like your game right now and where you're at and what, like are you kind of tweaking things or are you just kind of like slowly incrementally kind of refining where you're at like how do you how are you approaching it it's a good question and i maybe the the place to start is like when i think about you know at the top of the season 
uh, like what do I want to do this season? Uh, my goals are like almost never um, like related to scoring handicap swing. Like it's not the way I really think about golf. Like my golf goals yeah. for you would be like, I want to play in North Carolina because I haven't gone there yet. <laughs> so the right. the wide context is like, I don't even really like, or at least on the top of my radar of like golf goals, it's almost never grinding, tweaking, et cetera. Sick. But <laughs> I know it's the opposite of you, right? Like I say, it's like, it's cool. No, but I, like for me, that's that. ultimate. Yeah, for me, that's ultimate it. enjoyment. And for you, ultimate enjoyment is like, no, like I want to be good at this game. Like I want to, I want to have technique that's repeatable. Like I get it. Like I'm, I'm not wired that way, but I get people who are. Um, but in terms of goals, yeah, like I think um, I have a, I have a great buddy, uh, and he's a teaching pro in Vancouver. Works out of McCleary, Gordon Jarvis, uh, golf gains on Instagram. Yeah, awesome yeah, I've seen guy. Stuff. Yeah, he's the man. And part of why he's the man is he's able to take. Yeah, you know, I, I went and first saw him. 2017 he was working at golf tech at the time and he was able to like look at my terrible it was even more terrible than golf swing but then also talk to me and get to know me and he said to me he was like i don't think you're gonna like be a golf tech guy he's like golf tech is about like looking at your positions and getting you into something he's like you look like a playing lesson guy (laughs) he's like i need to get out on the golf course with you and we need to like talk about how you play golf so most of my golf goals still now, like when I think about my game, like aren't even swing related. Like I say to myself, I like, you know, this year, like I've noticed lately, I feel like my, my wedge play is off. And I say to myself, like, I need to be more dialed on these like 30 yard chips and pitches. I should be getting these closer. So like things I like, so what am I going to do this year? I'm going to play way more pitch and putt this summer than I have the last few years. Like I used to play it incessantly. The last few years, maybe I've gone once a week during the summer and it's like, no, right. I'm going to go every morning at sunrise for, you know, maybe not every morning, but like three, four days a week for a few months and grind on that. So like, that's something that's on my radar this summer. And then in terms of like actual other golf swing stuff, again, with Gordon as my guru, retraining my muscle memory of my swing just seems to me to be a futile endeavor. I can't imagine doing it, but you were it talking sucks. about, it's, oh, it's so the t- worst, right? <laughs> I'll, t- I'll tell you first, yeah. <laughs> Oh man, I don't know it's, how you. I don't know how you do it. To be honest, like I, I, I don't know physically. Like I have really poor body awareness. So if like you told me like, okay, I want your hands higher at the top instead of going flat and around. Like I get that. I can't do it. Like I physically like I go to do it and I'm like, oh, well, eh, like I move in the wrong way. <laughs> so you know what? You break it up into increments. Like um, you break it up into much smaller increments. So it's like you train you train one piece of the puzzle at a time and you just kind of form it, you know? So, you know, you, you figure out what is the biggest culprit and then you slowly just chip away. And like, once you kind of fix that thing, okay, now that creates the next problem because now, right. <laughs> now, right? And it's like a never ending game of whack-a-mole until you start to get to a point where it all starts to get fluid, but it takes a long time. And honestly, like you can have one to two full seasons that are a total write off as a result for that much of a change. Right. But if, if the hot, like the high for me is that the way I, I had a vision for how I see the ball flight and I wanted to be able to hit that ball flight. And so right. that's, so the joy now comes from being able to hit those shots and go, Oh yeah. Okay. That's exactly what I thought I could do. Right. That's funny. Cause one of the only things that has ever motivated me to, to work on things is like, one of the feelings that I literally don't get ever as a golfer with my golf swing is like really compressing an iron. And like, you know, for me, like a six iron is a 165 club and I kind of just float it up there and I'll play with someone and watch them compress that six iron from 185 and like watch that trajectory do what you feel like it should be doing. Right. And every now and then I'll watch that and be like, maybe that is worth trying to work on because man, that looks like it feels better than sex. Like that looks so good. But I don't. And <laughs> the conclusion of my point was because I'm not the guy to grind on that. Yeah. Um, Gordon looks at my swing, you know, when he does, when we play, or sometimes I'll send him a video and he goes, like, you know, your swing is your swing at this point. He goes, but gr- like, I have actually been emphasizing this lately because, man, I've realized how true it is. Like, grip and setup are so huge. Oh, man. Crazy, There's, right? Isn't it wild? Yeah. Well, like, most of, again, like, uh, for me, good golf doesn't mean hitting at 300. It means, keeping it in play and breaking 80 most of the time. And the amount of times, again, like, you know, as to actually ground this in something practical. So my driver miss historically 
has just been snap, like low snap hook. Like all of a sudden I'm ducking him off the tee. And, uh, you know, Gordon took a look at my swing at one point and he was like, wow, man, your trail hand is super, super strong. And you're aligned super, super close to target. And he's like, and I know he's like, you're a guy that does, even when he's playing his best, align a bit closed. And your, you know, your grip can be a, a little strong. He's like, but you've dialed them both to nine. Let's just like dial them back to your normal six. And I can actually tell you where this, this was at Westwood Plateau. And like, boom, went out there. And I'm not saying I was a better golf, like a great golfer overnight, but it was like, wow, we changed grip and setup by individual degrees. And oh, the snap hook's gone. Oh, like I'm hitting it better. So for me, like the degree to which I grind on swing is like when things get wonky, I see Gordon, he like nudges me back in the right direction so I can enjoy golf a little bit more and I'm on my way. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. No, I, but I think that's so great. I think that's just such a great way to go about for like, if that's how you want to enjoy the game, like that's such a easy, palatable way to like just keep yourself moving and not get too frustrated. Like, I, like I, I think that's what's great is like you just found a way to just keep yourself in that right sweet spot, and you have gotten incrementally better. And then you know there are days where, uh, like I saw that one, I was watching that one video a while back. It was like you were abandoned and you shot like. In the nineties, and then you shot <laughs> like like then you shoot even or like under par like the next day or something. It was it was like crazy. It's um, funny. I got it just to briefly interrupt because it's so topical for me right now. So yeah, it was ninety one seventy one on back to back days at Pacific Dunes. Okay, and when I was at Bandon Dunes last week, our first round we went out at Sheep Ranch, and we had just gotten there and the weather wasn't good and we just like wanted a warm up round. And I was like, I'm not going to film this. Like, let's just have fun. God awful shot 91. And then this time it wasn't 24 hours later. It was 48 hours later, went out there and broke par for the first time in my life uh, on a, on a like full length golf course. Sick. And it's frustrating because I'm editing the video right now. And I, it's going to show back to back rounds of 91, 71. Cause I had another 91 <laughs> sitting in the database somewhere. And I wish I had filmed the first one. Cause I think it's cool to see like same golfer, basically same day can go out to the same course and go, Worst score of my life, best score of my life. It's a and funny game. <laughs> so so I, I had a similar experience to that where in the same day, I had a tournament in the morning and I had a my, – mentally, I was not there. I shot 18 over. And then the, literally in the afternoon, I went out and played on my own because I was so pissed at myself. And I shot one over. And it was it, like the same day. So what was what – what, what makes that difference for you? Like what, what was it – can you pinpoint to something that you go – on a day like today, I'm going to shoot this. On a day like this, I'm going deep. Um, I, I, the best I can do is like reflect back to when I just did that a week ago and think through it. And interestingly, I would say it was like 50% something that was like technical, mechanical, and like 50% psychological. Okay. Um, so basically, you know, like often if I go out and have a really bad score, there is something like fundamental that's really off that day. So. Like, like I said in the past, sometimes I just like the grip gets too strong. I align too closed. Right. The other day when I did it, it was, I've now, I've kind of successfully eliminated, I, mean, I don't want to say permanently, but like I've hit far fewer odd snap hooks. Of course, now my miss is right. And sometimes it's off the planet right. So I feel like that, you know, on a particular, like really blow up day, it'll be something that starts, you know, a technical golf swing thing. But then, and I, I try to rarely, rarely do this. But I think it's like only human at some point when things are really, really off the rails, you mentally, like every shot in golf, right, requires so much like focus and respect. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I tr like I tr really try to keep myself motivated. If I'm nine over through nine, I say to myself, I can go even on the back. I've done that before and I can shoot 81 today. That's fine. I can go home with that. So usually like I find a way to always just stay motivated. But every now and again, when something's going sideways and it's usually not like, oh, I'm so pissed off it's going sideways. But it just, like, something mentally, like, I'm no longer able on hole 13 when I'm 16 over to get over that 20-footer and really give it my all. So I feel right. like 50% of that bad score is that technical thing. And then at some point, a massive component of it is I'm just not thinking through golf anymore. And when your yeah. skill set is as limited as mine, if you're not thinking through things, like, things can really go sideways. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting you talk to about kind of, rallying yourself because i it was a uh, video you did um with that guy nash at uh at northview where mm -hmm. i think i think he had you in the front but on the back i think you shot under par on the back and beat him 
like on. It did. Yeah, it was a good day. Yeah, and it was just, and and that was another one where again, like the putter just got like you, you had some, you put yourself in some good spots, good course management, and so it's interesting. So you're able to kind of really like rally yourself, and if you start to see a turn, you're like, okay, and you just ride that wave. Yeah, it's funny because I talk with a lot of people. Like to me, the the parts of golf I read about and grind on are these psychological things, and I find most, but not all, people will tell you, don't think about your score. Like, just hit the next mm-hmm. shot. And I don't subscribe to that for whatever. Like, I, I very much am. Don't fret how I'm playing my fifth on this par four. Like, don't think about that. But my number, like what I am t- relative to par, is almost always, I'd say 95% of the time it's in my mind, but only in a positive way. Like, like I just love, again, like, if I'm two under, I'm like, sweet. Like, and I'm feeling it. If I'm... 12 over, like I always, almost always find a way to say like, okay, like this will be a cool day for me if I can take what's going poorly, right the ship to the point that this isn't a bad score. This can still be a score that drops my handicap if I like make a few birdies. So like I'm right. always a guy trying to use score as a motivator. And I, I haven't encountered many people who recommend that. And maybe one day I'll, I'll switch off of it, but I feel like it's working for me right now. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's well, it's, you know, what? I think it's because you don't ever get defeatist about it. So I think then it, it can work, right? I, yeah. I know, I know some people, and even myself before. It took it took me a while to not think of score. I I I, I used to know exactly where I was at all times, and I found that really hard. Whereas now I'm at the point where I I like sometimes I don't actually know what I shoot until I edit the video. Mm, interesting. Like, like there have been a couple times where I I, I don't know. Um, I've tried to become very present. I also have the issue of trying to just constantly think and, you know, being a hot-blooded Italian sometimes just get a little too emotional. I have to, I have to calm myself down, you know? So it's been a lot to dial it back, but that's, that's really interesting of just, I, I'm always fascinated at what kind of drives people's mental games, right? Like what kind of gets you to rally and, and at what point you kind of just say, okay, you know, today's just not the day and we're just going to enjoy the last five holes here. Cause it's, it's ugly. Yeah, right? And, like, that does happen too, right? And, like, I try to make sure that those days are what you just described. All right, let's just enjoy the day and not, like, moping and ruining a day over it, which I can't imagine I've done that more than a handful of times, so. Yeah. Um, and actually, going, I just remember this too. When going back to that abandoned video, you had, I think it was one tee shot. It was early in the round on the first one, and uh, you were like, you went to, you went to swing and you went, nope, that's not it. And you, and you, and it was like, like before you even saw it, I was like, that's so good. Like, I, I like, I love that. Cause it's, it's so true. Like knowing before you've hit it and kind of goes back to the setup and, and some of those things, like there's just that intuitive feeling of like, when you know it's bad, but then being able to call yourself out on it before you'd hit. And I was like, you're like, nope, nope, not doing that. (laughs) Okay. Reset. And then I think, and then I think you hit it pretty good. So I was like, I I love, I I didn't hit it great. I actually really remember that moment. I didn't hit it great after that, but I hit it better than I was going to had I pulled the trigger on the first one. (laughs) I was like, I I love that. I love that. Um, so course management, cause I think kind of builds into, I think probably one of your biggest assets is, you know, you talk about how you, you kind of know your game and you know, you know what you are as a golfer. So then I think your strategic advantage is how you think your way around a golf course. So, you know, what is, what are your kind of tenets of course management and how, and, and like your overall philosophy? Yeah. Smart. Qu- like, so I, I'd have to think about that to give you a great answer. Cause I think, you know, sidekick talks about like plot your way from the green back, plot your favorite shot in. I don't think I necessarily do that. I think, um, I guess I just like noticed early while playing that like once you can you know make any kind of consistent contact with the ball most big scores happen from like bad decisions not bad shots right like so i think my basic premise is always like where like what's my ideal situation here and then what's the best miss for that like so i just find like so many um people who i'll play with who are let's say longer, like a lot of guys hit it way longer than I do and play off a way higher handicap. And they're always like every par five. It's like, okay, if it's in play, now I have 270 and I'm going for it. I'm hitting three wood. And like that leads to bad scores. And it's also then as another golfer, really, really sometimes like mentally difficult to like, you know, watch your playing partner either do that successfully or not. And you like, 
for me, let's say I, I hit a three wood 220. So if I'm 250 and sometimes it like, it's actually mentally difficult to be like, oh, I can't go, like I'm going to hit an eight iron here and then hit a wedge in. But I think like the, my principle starts with like, let's limit damage to, it's like really easy usually to limit damage to a bogey. Like if I'm out of position, put the ball back, like put the ball to somewhere where I can then hit it on the green and I'm a good putter. Like I'm going to two putt virtually 100% of the time. Mm-hmm. I guess, sorry, I'm kind of like answering this no, on no, the no, fly. No, no, this is great. This is great. Yeah, like I, I find I just often, you know, if I hit a tee shot out of position and then I'm looking at, like I'm assuming a par four, if my tee shot's out of position and my attempt to hit the green has even a 40% chance, or pick what the chance is, of I'm still in this situation and now I'm playing for double, like I'm not going for it. I like, my strategy is always just, how do I get like, there's almost always, unless you've really screwed the pooch, there's almost always a way to put the ball back into play where you can have like a wedge onto the green. That's almost always the case. And again, like, you know, not if you're playing in a tree line course and you're hooped, but like, it's almost always to pl- almost always possible to go back and play for bogey. And then even sometimes mentally know I'm playing for bogey here. And then sometimes that does turn into a double because guess what? You missed the green with the wedge, blah, blah, blah. But the p- amount of times you're going to make double while playing, trying to play for bogey compared to trying to scrap out the hero par. It's just like, it's so noticeable. I I love playing with both like really high handicaps and really low handicaps because high handicaps usually point out to me like, wow, you're going to make eight doubles around that could have been bogeys all from decision-making, not technique. Right. That's my long-winded answer to how I... No, 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 it's it's interesting because, and because for, it's, it's a lot of it is ego driven when, especially as guys, right? Like we, I, I always found people lose shots at a, it's a bravado thing. Yep. Right. And, and what I always found, this is actually what I, I, which kind of drew me to the sidekick stuff initially was just like, like who cares? Like low yep. scores are better than bravado. Right? Like, like better scores are better than that one hero shot you may pull off, you know? Um, so I always find that interesting. And I think like your stuff, you talk about that a lot too, of kind of removing the ego. And basically saying like, I can't hit this, so I'm just going to hit this, and then I, I've I've limited my opportunity at a big blow up. So which I I respect. I think I think for most people, whenever people ask like, how do you best way to lower your handicap? It's like that. Yeah, hundred percent. It's funny too because every now and then I'll get comments from people who are like, this looks boring as hell, man. I play golf because I want to play the hero shot, and I say again, like it all comes back to why do you enjoy golf? Cool. If you enjoy going for the hero shot and you're really not like you don't care if you shoot 100, awesome, go for yeah. it. But I find a lot of people say that. They say like I don't care, like I want to hit the hero shot. But then if they go for the hero shot six times around and shoot 100, then they're all pissed off. Yeah. So like my recommendation would be if lower scores is like what makes you feel fulfilled, you got to swallow your ego. And if just having fun and hitting hero shots is like what you want to do with golf because you only play once a week. You don't ca- keep a handicap. You just want to enjoy that. Awesome. Go for it. But try not to be in the third category of saying like, oh, I don't care. I'm going to go for hero shots and then getting dejected when your score goes sideways. It's like you got kind of got to pick a lane, right? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's very true. And it's, it's, it's a good like self-awareness thing, right? Like it's like, I, and I think, yeah, like it just seems like you're very self-aware of what your game is. And you just know it, and then you just play to that. And I, I think that's so. I, I think at any level of skill, it, right? You know, like I think that's the like scratch golfers. I see, you know, even myself. I could, I could sometimes use a little more self awareness from trying to over index on some shots. Like, it's it's something I've had to definitely manage. Um, when it comes to off the tee strategy, are you? Because are you familiar with decade? Of course, yeah. Okay, so. This is one thing, I, and I'd be, I'm very interested in your opinion on this because I found that I think decade works, but I do think, you know, when I was a when I was a ten to maybe a four handicap, and may, maybe even less, I just found that you know his whole thing is send it with the driver, yeah. like send it up there as far as you can. But when I was in kind of that handicap range, there were days when like the driver is just not a safe club in the bag. And so I like the sidekick way of going of like, sometimes you just have to rope a hybrid out there or dump a five iron out there or whatever. What, what's your kind of off the tee situation? Like how, how, do you, how do you view that? 
It's it's really funny you bring this up because I've been actually I have like a friend I play with frequently who's a big decade guy and we talk about this all the time. And I guess my general philosophy is like I actually think this thing about a lot of systematized golf things, aim point. There's like so many things in golf that are like, here's the system. Right. To which I say, like, systems are great. Like having a way of like methodically uh, thinking about something, and especially if there's like data backed up to show like that works, is sweet. Like it's great. But you can't be dogmatic about it, right? Like, right. exact. Like, yeah, maybe the underlying data uh, do reveal that like the send it with driver strategy on average, like over the long haul, is going to work. But you have to have a human element of going, yeah. But I can't hit my driver today. Like right. the driver, it's just gone today. Like I'm like, <laughs> so I don't care that over a thousand. Um, round sample, this is the best strategy, I need to adjust for what is clearly happening today. And funny enough, because like my driver um, has been a little, like it was bad for a while, and right now I find it's mediocre, but right now I do go out some days, I told you my miss is now right. And in the last probably 10, 15 rounds I've played, uh, I've probably shelf driver more than I ever have, just because I, I've, I've gone to a lot of tees that I'm like, okay, let's say a 380 yard par four, my best drive in Vancouver is going to be 250. And I go, the joys, the joys of sea level, right? Yeah. And like, (laughs) yeah, 250 is generous at this time of year, but yeah, uh, that's another funny aside about how far people think they hit it and how like there's many more elements than like how far do you hit a drive? But anyhow, let's say I'm playing a 380 yard hole and my drive, my best drive is going to go 250 and straight enough. And but my median drive that day is going 230 and right rough. I've been hitting hybrid really, really well lately. Like I can definitely hit my hybrid 210 straight off the tee far more often on a lot of days lately than I can hit my driver out there. So like uh, even in my my career round at Bandon, like I think I Bandon's also a particular place where you don't need to hit driver all that often. But nonetheless, played a ton of golf lately, shelfing driver, like kind of the anti-decade strategy. Yeah. And maybe th- this is a a little hooey, but like, <laughs> even put. I think it has worked for scores, but even putting that aside, it's like my heart rate isn't as high in the golf course. I'm not sitting over this drive that I'm like, ah, like, so just literally in the moment, putting aside my score, just like enjoying the round more because I'm making decisions that are just easier. Like that alone to me, like put aside score, I'm not playing on tour. I just enjoyed the round of golf more because I was like more comfortable over shots. Yeah, okay, so, and, and I... I had kind of felt the same thing of like the human element of, you know, I, cause I under, do you play one shot shape as well? Or cause I've seen you kind of work it kind of both ways with some of your other clubs, but off the tee, are you kind of a one shot shape guy? Or are you a, well, I, I used to be pure draw guy. Now I'm miss right guy, but I can still pull the draw out, but that's actually caused more damage than it's done. So short answer right now, I'm a, I, I can hit it both ways, but not necessarily on command. <laughs> Got it. Got it. Yeah. Cause because I'm kind of with you of that, you know, there are holes where I don't know if it's the how it looks or there's a feeling. And it's I even like I even noticed it at my home course that I've played thousands of times at this point. Right. I've played this, these holes so many times and there are just certain looks where it's like I can hit the same. I know I can hit this drive, but optically there's something that just my body won't allow me to commit to this shot in that manner. So the math, the math says I should be doing this, but the human in me says, ah, oh, but there's, if I just, if I just hit four iron here instead of driver, I am in play and at least I have a shot at making, at, at making par versus yeah. the alternative. Yeah. And I think, like I said, like from, both from the standpoint of put aside score and all the data, like, are you going to enjoy golf more doing that? I think that's one element. And then I also think, like, to an extent, the proof is in the pudding because you see guys on tour do this, right? Like, you, like uh, Tiger, like, I'm just remembering that. Like, you know, Tiger's hated it. The amount of times he would just, like, hit a stinger out there with a two iron or, like, hit his three wood. Yeah. And it's like, again, I, I mean, Tiger's in a different realm than every other human who's ever played golf. But it's like, these guys are doing the same thing. Like, they're saying, you know what? I see this. I see this shot here, and it's what I'm comfortable hitting, and it's what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, and... and- and I listen. I love what Scott's done with Decade. I I think it's brilliant, and I I it, it is it has changed the game. But yeah, there's there is that extra, there's that human side, that because even um you know you see the guys fight about like hitting up to certain yardages, 
right? But I can tell you for a fact right now, for me, a 45 year, 45 year shot is infinitely more scary than 115 for me right now. Exactly. Like, actually, I want to fall on that because it's, I read something like two kind of conflicting things about this. One of the things I read in the study of this was, I think it was like two or 3% of golfers are better from a hundred yards than they are from 25 yards. So that, and that, this is kind of preaching decade, man, got to get it closer to the hole. You think like, because there's, there, we have like so many weird uh, biases and ways of thinking where like, yeah, when you hit that bad shot from 25 yards, you're like, oh, I screwed it. But it's like, that's still better than a lot of your shots from a hundred yards. So there's that. But then conversely, and I've had the same thing. I, I, I have been chili dipping wedges lately. So again, it's like maybe on average, yeah, I'm better from that 25 than 100. But if it's a day where I just don't feel it with that wedge from 40 yards, I don't care what the data say. I'm chili dipping them today. I don't want to do it anymore. I'm laying up to 100. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and, and it's that soft turf that we play with on the Pacific Northwest that it's taken me a while to, to get comfy with that. Hundred percent. Oh man, because yeah, because that's because uh, it's interesting. Yeah, because the systematization of golf, you know, there are things that yes make total sense, and even like for putting, I can you know a lot of things of just like stop trying to make putts and just kind of lag it up close. Like there's a lot of things where it's like okay, that's that's good advice. Like, but I, it's always the it's basically the off the tee strategy that I'm just so curious of, especially when it, especially as your handicap gets higher, because that driver becomes less and less reliable. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like my, my coach who played on the Asian tour and stuff like that decade for him, hundred percent. Cause he's never going to hit driver in a bad way. That's going to really hurt him, you know? Mm-hmm. So it makes sense for him. Send it all day. Yeah. And that doesn't get his, that for his heart rate is calm doing that. Right. I, I aspire to that level of calmness <laughs> with the, you know, to get to that point. Um, okay. So course manager, we got all that. So now are you, are you into are you into gear like the, the, do your clubs like yeah. how do your clubs how do your how do your clubs matter or do they not or you know I, I'll I'll say this I'm more of a gearhead than I let on because I I like okay. to say and it's true like I always say like you know let's start with like irons because I think it's the easy one so like you can play a game improvement iron and it's going to hit the ball farther and we've developed like certain technologies that now game improvement clubs don't have to look as ugly as they used to and yes they like they're going to hit the ball farther blah blah blah. With that said, generally, I don't really think, like, you know, any, like I could pick up a set of tailor-made game improvement irons from 1995 and play the game just as well as I do with them now. So, like, I always tell people, like, you know, people will call me uh, who are getting into golf there at golf time. Like, what's the best brand of irons to buy? I'm like, that's not the way to think about this. <laughs> right? I'm like, yeah. Um, now, with all of that said, I like looking down on pretty clubs. <laughs> um, so... I've just like always really, really, really liked the look of Titleist Woods. I just find, right? Like I can just pick that, up a- Just that black. Yeah. Just clean, classic look. Yeah. It's not changing year to year. I know I can pick one up that's 10 years old or their brand new model and it's going to just look right to my eye. So like, um, I, yeah, I forever, well, I did this PXG thing. That's another story. But basically I am always playing Titleist Woods and, and hybrids. Um, and then with irons, this is where I'm more of a gearhead than I let on. So I'm a terrible ball striker, right? Like, I'm just not a ball striker. I don't generate speed. I don't hit a flush. I don't hit it consistently. I should be playing, like, super game improvement irons. Would be, again, if, if we're systematizing golf, my scores are going to be better with game improvement irons. Like, 100%, no question. I don't like looking down on most game improvement irons, and I'm, like, willing to accept that I shoot poor scores with the irons I have. But guess what? I like looking at them. <laughs> so that's right. Yeah, that's fine. Like, like I like look like again to me this is kind of an ethereal thing I'm out on this beautiful park I want to look down on like something that looks like bespoke and like cool so like actually hold on I happen to have my golf bag here oh, if perfect. I can get this out uh, I've got these like rusted out sub 70 they're like I don't know a small cavity yeah, or whatever yeah. and some custom ferrules on them some really really cool brown leather grips from this company called Best Grips they're like super tacky Anyway, the whole thing, they just kind of like, you, I, I've yet to go out to a golf course and see someone using this setup. And to me, that's like kind of fun. And so, yeah, more of a gearhead than I let on. Um, wedges, I love all wedges. I play pitch. Like I, just, I, I can put any wedge in my hand and be a happy guy. Um, Are you high, and, do you use more bounce or less bounce with the, the kind of soft conditions? 
Uh, I kind of, if you consider, I don't know if you consider like 10 bounce medium or high these days, I guess that's kind of high. That's kind of where I am. I don't, I don't know. I, I, I play 10 bounce. I, it, the problem is every company's kind of different. Like their bounces, it, bounces are not created equal. Yeah, it's true. You know, like some stuff you got grind in there and yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Um, uh, sorry, go ahead. And then you have your, and then, so, so, and what brand are your wedges? Uh, right now they're also these sub seventies. Uh, oh, cool. I used to play like I was but just because I was kind of a Titleist loyal guy. I played Vokies. I liked them. The only time I ever kind of went way off the board with clubs was I was so tempted to do like a full fitting with PXG. The full it was a great discount to do like fourteen clubs in a bag. And I have to say their wedges felt fabulous. I, th- I was most impressed with their wedges. I've heard they're good. Um, they're really good because they're soft forged. And man, they they look cool. They feel great. Someone stole one of them, which really sucked. Uh, anyway, now I play these sub seventy ones and. They don't feel as good, but I'm, I'm not. I'm not whining. I actually kind of care more about like from wedges, like the feel of the ball than the feel of the wedge. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um. So yeah, and then I guess the final piece, right, with putter. Putter's the funny one. Like, where are you at? Like, are you? Do you tinker with putter? Are you loyal to a putter? Like, where have you been with putter? Oh, dude, I've, I'm a disaster with putters. Okay. <laughs> I, I have been a disaster. I think I finally found home base, but I have historically been an absolute disaster with putters. So and do I've, you get? Sorry, go ahead. No, yeah, yeah. So I, I've just tested. I've dropped. I've spent stupid amounts of money trying to solve the putter, but I've I've figured out. You know, I had to figure out what I what I can align myself with. I need to like my issue with putting is being able to square up, mm-hmm. and so I found it. And and also, uh, I need the right amount of toe hang. Mm-hmm. So it was the combination of those two things, and it took me a while to one know that was what I needed, and then two find the right putter to do it. So I'm really curious because, again, like we're so on the opposite ends of the spectrum about like how we grind. Yeah. Did you come to that by like going – I know at Morgan Creek here in Vancouver, there's like a fabulous putter fitting studio. Like did you go like let's get the data and do this or was this by feel? Like how, like, how did you come to figure out like what – So I've done is? both. I've, okay. I've, I have an issue with testing stuff in isolation. I have found that once I, – I can basically hit anything in a bay or on Quintic – and make the numbers look pretty good. You, Cause you just, you know, you get it, you make some adjustments, you go. Mm-hmm. But kind of what you're saying about what's gonna, what, what keeps my heart rate low when I'm actually out there. And so a lot of it is like, I did a Quintic fitting to kind of get an idea of what my stroke is. And we made some adjustments to how I, how I move. Um, and then actually one really cool thing that made a big difference is, um, have, you, have you heard of Ryan Hawley out here? Yeah, yeah, I've seen Ryan. Yeah, okay. yeah. Ryan's the man. Yeah, so um, we did a putter experiment where if you shift your weight more than 4% back to front while you putt, it changes your attack angle. Whoa, you're so, blowing my so, mind right now. Yeah, dude. What? Wow. So, wow. We did, so we did an experiment. <laughs> so so once I ironed out the stroke in that and I realized, okay, like, like I'm not hurting my putts based on my technique, then it became what is going to – under the gun, under tournament conditions, when the greens are slick. Because, you know, you always find that, like, even on, even on rounds when you're not really caring, I, could, I always found, like, a, you know, I could kind of get around with almost any putter, but then when a tournament would come in and it's, like, almost like that different part of your brain clicks in. Or maybe, you know, like, when you're trying to film a, a course log and, like, the camera's on, you're at a new spot, and you're, like, and all of a sudden you're, like, what am I doing with this putter? Yeah. And so I had there. to find that. And I have found that, in, honestly, it's this $120 Cleveland putter. Yeah, man. The scariest guy to play golf with, right, is the guy who shows up and has a ratty 40-year-old looking putter. That guy can putt. Yeah, you're like, oh. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so, dude, I have a, it's literally, it's the cheapest putter Cleveland makes. And I have tried everything. The only other putter I, I'm still potentially going to give one more opportunity to is the lab putter. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because just with the science, it just seems like, it makes a lot of sense. I just, I think I just need time with it. To- I got a funny story about them, actually. Oh, okay. I was out playing uh, in Bend, Oregon, uh, which is an, like an unheralded mecca of golf. There's more good golf in Bend, Oregon than almost any place I've ever been. Wild. <laughs> yeah, it's really, because it's the middle of nowhere. Um, like as in the middle of nowhere as Bandon is, just not on the coast, it's inland. And I'm playing with a friend and the course is running really slow. And we end up joining this foursome in front of us. Um playing as a sixum because it was a shit show. And I'm looking at one of the guys, and I'm like, this guy looks so familiar. And then next hole comes, and I'm like, oh, they've all got lab putters. Finally, I'm like, I look at this one guy, I'm like, I, 
I'm like, I've seen you on YouTube, maybe. And he kind of laughs. I'm like, okay, like, what's the, what, who are you? <laughs> yeah, he's the CEO of Lab Putter and the, nice. the exec team there. And then we geeked out on lab stuff for like the next week. And then I, the problem is, and I told him this at the time, like, I, I hit one of their, uh, their putters, there's something going on there. Like, the, <laughs> like, there's a bunch of science there. All I can say is you pull that putter back and you're like, whoa, this is different. And I was like, I should probably get one. And then I thought to myself, my, one of my own rules of putting is if you're putting well, don't change your putter. <laughs> just, just don't do it. And it's like, putter's the best club in my bag. So I was like, this is really cool and I really want one, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> yeah, and, and, I, and I think with the lab, that's almost, I think, the ethos. Like if you're a good, because the interesting thing is you don't see any guys, top strokes gain putting guys using lab putters. Interesting. Like, and I, and I don't, I, last time I checked, there wasn't, it may, it may have changed, but it, it almost seems like lab is something you go to when you're just, you're, you're not that, like, you just don't have that natural intuitive feel. Mm-hmm. And so you need something to help manage that. Mm-hmm. And so it, because of the technology, you're, it just helps kind of eliminate that variable. But, but for someone like you, and actually it's like what I said off the hop, you seem to make an absurd amount of long putts. Yeah, that, I, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, but but that's indicative of like you match speed and line well. So it's like, why throw a wrench into that? Because it also will fundamentally change your putting stroke, from what I've heard. For because sure, there's, for sure. Because there's no there's no movement to it, right? Mm-hmm. So if which you, in, if in you theory put, is way better, right? But who knows? Who knows how yeah. theory translates to practice? <laughs> right, and it, it, if for you, you know, putting bails you out of trouble. Yeah. <laughs> so. If it's almost like it'd be worth the experiment, but at the same time, it's like, are you, are you tinkering unnecessarily in an area that's good? Like, like my actually concern would be, um, I tested a, I did a off season. So every winter I kind of do like a bit of an off season training protocol where I just basically go nuts. I try everything, try and see where I can like fill holes. Right. Mm-hmm. And just, you know, save a shot here, save half a shot here, wherever. So I, my big thing right now is I'm trying to figure out the right driver for me. And part of that mm-hmm. has been a technique issue. And then part of that is, is I think, uh, an actual driver component issue. But one of the issues I found with the Titleist driver was just, it's great, but it spins like crazy. Mm-hmm. And, and I you don't need if, spin, and I do, right? <laughs> well, but I wonder, but I wonder if it, I wonder if it might spin. To, I wonder if you, you maybe are playing too spinny of a driver. Have you, have you gotten on the lawn? Have you gotten it on a monitor? Not with my current setup. See, I'm, this is this was bad of me. I got, when I got fit for my PXG driver, they fit me into the shaft that I really liked the feel of. And there were times when I was my I was hitting that driver better than I've ever hit anything. Uh, eventually, we were talking about looking at things. I hated looking down on the thing. Really, really hated it. It was uh, one that had all this silver and black. I hated it. Yeah. And I was like, I'm going back to a Titleist driver. And I found someone selling a head online. And I was like, sweet, I'll just pair my shaft with it. But it's like... It's not just shaft, right? It's like how shaft and head combine. Yeah. And uh, yeah, right now I'm not playing. It's so basically the point is it's not fitted and who knows if... I think you get a rough idea sometimes like when you hit one perfect and you look up and you go, okay, what did that look like? Um, and yeah, right now I probably am spinning it up a little bit too much, which has conventionally been the opposite of what I have going on. But anyway. Yeah, because that's like... like Because you, you and, you and uh, Dave, who's on the podcast, he's... Uh, he, you guys hit it probably similar distances. And one of the things we've been working on for him is trying to find that optimal bag setup to just, you know, cause he plays like a driver and then he plays a really hot three wood. That's almost like a two wood. Mm-hmm. And then he goes like five wood and on down. Um, and he's like that two wood is like money because it's like a tailor made TI titanium three wood that just like screams. And so then we've been trying to find the right driver that then, uh, cause a couple drivers just go the same distance as that yep. three wood, which then is like negates the whole point. So it's, you know, we've been trying to find the right one for him to just get that little extra pop. So then when he can really send it, he's good. But then if he needs to, you know, be a little more conservative, he's still got basically a driver in there that he can control. I'll tell you why I love this talk because we've talked all about like, you know, technical grinding this and that, like, I'm not going to change my swing, but it is the case. Like you can't buy a better game. Like you can't buy a whatever but you can as as we're talking about like get fit into clubs that fit you better and like perform better for you and i love this because i'm like oh yeah maybe if i uh go and do a driver fitting i can gain 20 yards without changing my swing <laughs> but, you know what though you are i think so when it comes to fitting though you're 100 like i think someone so i've been burned by fitting because if you change 
what you get fit for almost can become irrelevant. Yeah, that's true. Right. So I've run into problems where I'll get fit for something. And then in six months, it, my delivery is, is changed a ton. And it's just, and now it's useless for me. Yep. So that sucks. But for someone like you, fitting can actually be, I think like that's like perfect because you're like, this is the, this is the world I live in. How do I optimize this world? Yeah. And I think you can, you could probably get a lot more lasting benefit out of a proper fitting because you're like, your delivery is probably not going to change that drastically. And if it does get off the rails, like you're saying, you just go back to your, your guy, Gordon, and you just boom. Yeah. A little patchwork. You know, a little patchwork <laughs> and, you, and you can make it work because with technology now and stuff, like what ball are you playing? Okay. Here's another one. I started playing a, a Pro V1X recently. Okay. No idea if that's smart. I just like, uh, I like the feel of a Pro V. It's softer. And then I started reading, I was like, because I, <laughs> I try not to buy too many golf balls. <laughs> so I try to find uh, one benefit of a private club. You find a lot of Pro V1 sitting around. <laughs> yeah. But anyhow, so I went to buy some balls the other day and I was reading about the profile of the X and it was like more spin, more height, which definitely on my irons I need. So I've been playing that lately, but who knows? I should probably, like, I think this conversation is alerting me to the fact that I should probably get in front of a launch monitor before this season really begins in earnest and maybe figure some of this out. <laughs> yeah, well, because the ball, again, I see ball ball's interesting. I've, like, become more religious about the ball. Okay. As a, as a result of consistency. And I don't know if you follow my golf spy or any of their stuff. I do. It's, man, some of their stuff, like the, sorry to interrupt you, but I think, like, the most interesting thing I read there in the last two years uh, they did one on, you know, how much does like a scuff mark or whatever affect yeah. the ball. And it's like basically the second there's a scuff on a ball big enough that you can feel it with the fingernail. Dead. That ball's done. Yeah. It goes into the pra- <laughs> it goes into the shag bag for practice. Yeah, exactly. Which is like so, sim- simple things we don't think of. Because when I was like a 10 handicap, like I was just like, we yeah, whatever ball. Sure. And there was like a point of pride back then being like, oh, like I played with this ball for six rounds and didn't lose it. And it's like, no, but if it was all scuffed up, you were losing 15 Dude, yards I, and a I thousand still, RPM. I still remember like I, I, I have the ball where I did a, my first full 18 without losing a ball. Awesome. I kept it with the scorecard. And I'm like, I was like, yes, <laughs> didn't lose one. Well, because the other thing that always hurt too is like, I man, because the, the price of premium balls is just, it nuts. hurts. It's nuts. And I just remember like every time I'd hit one out, I'd just be like, well, there's seven dollars on fire. <laughs> well, there's seven dollars on fire. And that's like if and it, like you want to talk about the mental game, absolutely going sideways. <laughs> Start calculating how much money you're losing in balls while you're playing. It's and- so funny, man, because <laughs> Uh, if you, anyone who watches my channel knows that like my biggest sponsor and I plug them super hard is Swing Tweaks, right? Like an instruction app. Yeah. I don't mean to turn your podcast into an advertisement, so I won't. But I do say this genuinely because I mean it. I watch exactly what we're talking about. Guys go out and they lose five premium balls around, and I'm like, man, get a lesson. Like, like you're you're already spending the money. You're yeah. already spending oh, yeah. it. Just redirect this money and lose fewer balls and get better at golf. But and, and again, like you know, I can say that, and then I'm that guy too. Like, it's, there's so many things in this game from everything we've talked about: course management, gear, all this stuff that is so much easier to say than to practice. And like, I, um, oh, I swear there was an interesting point in there. Oh yeah, like I get a lot of emails. I, this is like really heartwarming. I get a lot of emails from people who are like, "Man, like the channel's so cool." I'm like trying to buy in, but like I can't, man. Like, what is the key to? not getting fumed after a bad shot and stuff. And one of the, I think my most common answer is like, it, it's this combination of like, you can't do it all at once. And also like, the reason it's hard is because you have to choose to do it 80 times during a round. Like you have to still commit to like using the right mindset. So it's like, you're not going to do it 80 out of 80 times. Like you're not. So if, if you can do it one more time than you did in the last round, if you can take one less hero shot, like that's a sweet improvement. And like, and just understand and don't like kick yourself on all these things we're talking about that like, again, I don't need to preach this to you. You're a far better golfer than I, but to like the guys who are trying to kind of still put the puzzle together, it's like golf is all these individual moments. And like, if you can be better in one individual moment, like you've done better than you did the last round. So it's not about like a light bulb going and all of a sudden you're, a Zen master of course management and staying calm in the moment. Like just 
if there was one less club throw and one more smart decision, like that's your new baseline. And now it's like, can I improve from that? Right. Well, absolutely. And, and I think too, you know, going from like breaking, you know, when you're trying to break 90 for the first time, it's the same feeling when you're trying to break 80. And then when you're trying to break par, like, I think when everyone says too, like, you know, like, like, you know, oh, you're like better golfers. So it's, you know, you you may not think of it as same. It's like one thing I've learned through going throughout of this is that like the feeling actually doesn't change. Like how I felt breaking 80 the first time was same, same as breaking par. Like it, you know, like those, those milestones. So we're all kind of the same things. Like the same lessons are very applicable across the board. Just the margin for error just gets smaller and smaller as you kind of get better and score. And that's exactly right. And that becomes more terrifying. Well, that's the cool part though, right? Because yeah, like in order to improve from breaking 90 to breaking 80, it's like, yeah, like make fewer of those things. And as you say, the margins get smaller and smaller, which is why it's just inherently hard. But like, I don't like, I don't think you and I, like, again, we're different caliber golfers, but like, we're not outliers in the sense that like, you do get there, right? Like, you, like I can't believe my shitty golf game. People look at my swing and say, you broke par. And it's like, yeah, like you, you do this enough. You commit to the process enough. You're going to get some breaks from the golf god sometimes. And like, you do get there. And yeah, it's just a matter of like, like we're saying, just like, it's, it's actually the same process again, trying to break 90, 80, 70, probably not 60. But other than that, right? You're yeah, like you say, you're kind of doing the same thing. You're just like, you got to make one fewer error. And then to break 70, you got to make four fewer errors, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I love that. And I, and, and, and that's a big thing, you know, is, is just trying to get people to calm down. Like I have a thing called, you have to earn your anger. Mm. So one thing I started to, uh, like, I started to impose on myself and I, I also said this to other people, cause you know, it's really going through this journey of, of kind of being somebody that, you know, four and a half years ago was playing golf three times a year to someone that plays every day. Right. So like going through that journey of, of having no expectations to then suddenly having expectations of a game and, and all these things, you, you realize that in order to play the golf that people envision they have, they want to play, it takes just so much insane daily effort, right? Mm-hmm. Like when I see the stuff that my coach went through to be a pro golfer and, you know, it's like, and I'm trying to put myself on that path. It's almost like when you see people get mad, you're like, dude, you, you just don't put in the reps to get that angry. Yeah. So it's okay. Like, <laughs> like you sit at a, you sit at a desk all day. You are going to early extend on Saturday when you go play, because yeah. you are not doing hip mobility during the week. You're not doing the things you need to hit the ball the way you think you deserve to hit the ball. Yeah. So well said. I've all, I, I've also heard this said as you're not good enough to get angry. <laughs> yeah. You gotta earn. You, you gotta earn your anger. So if you were grinding and you're like practicing and then you're like it's not working, then like I can understand getting angry. And it's like, okay, well then let's take a look at it and let's let's sort through the problem. But but I I, I tell a lot of my buddies, it's like, man, like, and I think Fred Couple said this too. Golfers also don't understand how many good sh- when they hit a good shot, how good that shot really is. Yeah, I've heard that interview. Actually, a buddy of mine, uh, same buddy I was in uh, in uh, Bend, Oregon with. It was funny. I, that was such a that was probably the most mentally difficult golf I've ever had to play because. Like I was saying, there's, and just to call them out, Pronghorn, where there's two courses, Tethero and Crosswater are where we played. And all of those courses, especially the Pronghorn ones, were like some of the best courses I've ever played. And I literally, for actually the first time ever, had like a true case of the shanks. Like I shanked, I must have shanked 40, 50 balls on course that weekend. Sick. And, uh, I was like in good spirits insofar as like I wasn't, I really hope, I don't think I was. I don't think I was ruining my buddy's day, but like obviously you hit a shank and you're like, ah, and like, and then I'd get over the next one and I'm kind of smiling and looking at my buddy and joking like, here comes another one. And after the round, he sent me a book that was more of like a pamphlet and I'll find it. And um, it was a good recheck for my mental game because he was like, yeah, man, he's like, even though like you're in good spirits, he's like, you were setting yourself up to keep doing it. And one, one of the, the biggest takeaway I had from this very short read was, and I, I have tried doing it, you look like an asshole doing this, but it kind of works, is he said, like the, the premise is, how many times do you like get angry and go, oh, that was terrible in a round? Compared to how many times in a round do you hit a good shot and go, great shot? Like just to yourself, great shot. Totally. And so I've tried to do the exercise of like, seriously, yeah, like when you pure one, just like say out loud, like and not to your group, just kind of yourself, like, man, great shot. And totally. just just doing that 
And then front, like, again, you can still say, oh, that was a shitty shot, but like just vocalizing out loud when you hit a good shot, which is kind of similar to couples things. Like you don't real like amateur golfers, like hit a shot from 150 to 20 feet. They don't realize how good that is for them. Say to yourself, like, great shot, man. And like it, it's hard to like stay committed to that because again, you kind of feel like an idiot saying that stuff to yourself. But it, like in my experience, my limited experience trying it, it works. No, hundred uh, totally. Um, have you ever heard of Vision Fifty Four? Don't think so. So it's P. Uh, it's these two uh, female instructors from Sweden, and they talk about that. Like I think it's a thing called D E H A in the brain, and if those Af- like you have to signal to the brain when you do something good. To, that you've done it because your brain, like you have to build those patterns of good because we're so quick to go. Like I know for me, when I, I would hit a bad shot, I'd be like, yeah, see, you are garbage. Like that would be my first, I used to, that would be my first thing I used to go to be like, ah, see, I knew you were trash. And I'd be like, I'm like, no. like, like looking back, like just the worst way to go about it. Right. Like it's like, we're trying to be trying to have a fun day out here. And then you shank one, you go, ah, see, like, but but 100%, like now I try and really savor the good shots and and especially in tournaments to try and be like like um, the King's Links event that I met you at. Yeah. It was the, that was one of the first tournaments where I saw shots that I had been practicing and I saw them in real life for the first time and I went, oh, sweet. And I left like... I left high as, uh, higher than a kite. That you were high as a kite when I bumped into you after, actually. It was funny. Yeah. I was with a buddy, and you were just, like, floating. And I had played pretty poorly that day. And, like, you were great vibes that day. It was fun. Yeah, I was, <laughs> I was loving it. Well, I'd never seen that course before. First time playing it. Really? Yeah. Never. I showed up blind and, uh, and came in third in my flight. And was Good like, for you. That's a course more than any other I can think of in the lower mainland where you need some course knowledge to play that golf course. I, well, I had lucky. My, a buddy of mine had played it a lot and kind of gave me some some basics of okay. like. So I had I had a little bit of a of an insider cheat sheet on a couple of things, which ended up working out really well. But um, but yeah, that was like I've been really trying to do exactly what you're saying. Like I, it, it does make a big difference because I had a lot of shots during that round that didn't go well. But I was able to kind of rally the troops. I had one stretch where I went double eagle, double birdie. <laughs> That's wild. <laughs> that might be something you never replicate again. <laughs> yeah. It was like, like and my, my buddy's watching the scores in real time, and he's like, what is happening? But it's funny. Like, I never got too high from, from the eagles. I never got too low from the doubles. Just kind of like, you know, it was just like, we're just keeping it moving. Um, actually, I want to shout out your shot from that video so it would have been hole nine, but I don't know what hole you started on because it was the shotgun. The when you did the bump hybrid, mm, mm. I ju- yeah that on, would- ca- <laughs> on camera. I wanted to scream when I saw that because I don't think people understood. So this, so some context for this hole, guys. Okay, so dog leg left, water on left. You have to drive it, and then like the green is kind of perched. Everything slopes back to front. Long is absolute death. Yeah. I ended up, so I actually, ironically, we both got up and down on that hole, but the way you got up and down was way cooler than the way I got up and down. Continue. I'm curious to hear what you did too, though. So, (laughs) so I hit driver and then my, I've had wedge issues. So I line drived it through the green, went over and I chipped it and then hooped a 10 footer to make, to, to, (laughs) to make the pot. That works. But you, but you were in a brutal spot because the pin was like, the pin was on a perch and if like everything was running away from like it, it was on the perch, it was, it, there was no chance. And you just nuzzled this like perfect little bump hybrid to like so close. And I was like, dude, that, that shot was fucking crazy. How good that was. You know, I don't want to brag, but I will back that up by saying one of the, right. My job is I go out and film golf and I'm filming on an iPhone and more than anything you really really lose filming on a phone what greens are like and like that's like a really good example right i also so that event usually i'm filming myself in a tournament i have a buddy out filming for me because you don't want to be that guy in a tournament getting accused of looking at your swing on video blah 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 so he positioned the camera as best he could and you're right that was an impossible spot (laughs) and i will both brag about that shot and be self-effacing about it that that was a fabulous up and down that was also 
unequivocally the best shot I hit all day. <laughs> it was a putt with the hybrid. <laughs> so it wasn't a ball striking day, but that was, I, I, yeah, I remember watching the video going like, wow, I wish this could have been captured. Like if you would have seen that, if, a, if an actual film crew, like in a golf yeah. tournament would have been filming that, you would have seen like, that was a hell of a shot. Oh, I don't man. know how it worked out, but it did. Dude, yeah. <laughs> like this, the, cause the contour, like there was, you, you were dead. Yeah. Yeah. That was a like, dead yeah. spot. Like, like when I saw the video, over. I was for sure like, oh yeah, okay, cool. He's going to like, like, it's going to roll forever and then, and then not, but man, the touch chef's kiss. Phenomenal. Right. It worked that time. 50% of the time it works every time, right? Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> uh, quick thing before we wrap up is, so what's the, what's the plan for the channel now? Like now that, so what were you doing before career wise? I, I worked in tech and sales in San okay. Francisco. So I was selling software to enterprise companies and slinging software. And now yeah. you're slinging, slinging golf balls. Yeah, and I was selling better software than my golf game. Like my golf game is now what I sell, and I'm worse at that than I was at that. Anyhow, but yeah, uh, the channel goals. So it's really tough. I like if I can be perfectly honest, I almost feel like to an extent in the last twelve months, I I became a bit complacent, just because again, like all (laughs) one of the reasons I didn't mind giving up a more lucrative career is because I, you know, I was working really hard before getting sick. And then I really loved golfing. And it's like, I didn't go back into that career because I'm like, if I went back into that career, I'd be making more money and playing less golf. And what's the point of making the money if I don't get to do the thing I love? So anyhow, for the last year, I I feel like I felt so privileged to be playing so much golf that I didn't really lean into some things that from a business standpoint, I probably should be doing. So nuts and bolts of that are like right now, in terms of the income I make through my YouTube channel, it's exclusively through advertising, right? It's either ads in my videos that YouTube is placing there or sponsors like Swing Tweaks and others that pay me to do ad reads. Um, So like the question I asked myself, like this is kind of the New Year's resolution was like, what am I adding to the golf community? Like like what am I doing that's valuable? And are are there ways for me from a business standpoint to be capitalizing on that other than just producing videos? So how much should I say and not say? Um, I don't want to be like coy, but I'll, no, I'll no. say. Yeah, yeah, because I don't want you to expose any of your plans that are upcoming. It's more, it's more out of curiosity. Well, the, I'll, I'll, I'll tease this one because this one's fun. Like, I'll, I'll say this. There's kind of three projects going on that I'm doing that where I think I'm going to make cool stuff, add things to the golf community. Uh, and one of them uh, that is simultaneously kind of the easiest one, but the most fun one uh, is – so many people watch my videos and they're like, like, where are you playing? Like, can you play with me in this place? So I was like, it's time to do some meetups. Like, these, like I have great relationships with a lot of golf courses that like have said like we're happy to host. And why not? I'm going to tease it now because it's going out in a video tomorrow anyway. Um, PGA West is sort of like my biggest course backer. They love having me there. So they said, why don't we get a bunch of your guys out here? We'll give you guys all discounts on rates. We'll host it. We'll do this and that and the other thing. So we're going to start doing that. We'll see how often we're able to do them. Uh, but the idea is get 20 to 28 guys out. I don't think the one thing that's still not clear, like we have a, I have a whole schedule of like golf meals, clinics. So it's all going to happen. The only thing we haven't really determined is the golf itself. Are we going to do a tournament? And I'm kind of leaning against that. Cause it's like not really my vibe. So I still kind of need to figure out one extra like little piece of how are we going to make the golf really engaging without making it, you know, like we're all having to tap in our one footers cause it's a tournament. So that piece is still up in the air, but the point is we're going to get a bunch of, and we're going to try to do this on a recurring basis, get viewers of the channel, come together, we golf together, we stay at a cool place, we eat good meals, we do all that stuff. Love that. Yeah. That's awesome. And And PGA West will pay me to go out there, so that's nice. That's that's very solid. (laughs) Uh, And then any big, any big trips, any big, like you said, North Carolina, what are like, what any big bucket list spots trying to check, check off this year? Not really. Like I I have a, like my next two months, the calendar is full of golf, but it's all, to be honest, it's all my usual places. It's California, Oregon, and elsewhere in British Columbia. So I guess the only like a 2024, like summer or fall goal will be, I've I've never played golf on the East coast ever. I've never played golf East of Alberta, Canada in my life. So, uh, I've played two rounds in Scotland other than that. So a 2024, like just golf goal is like, I got to do an East coast trip. I would think it's going to be to the Carolinas. Sick. Yeah. Very sick. And then the final, the ultimate question, because you are, you, you have gotten better and you are continuing to get better. A little bit. Will not a scratch golfer ever (laughs) potentially hover around scratch? It's funny. Like this is my true honest answer. I don't think so. Like you've done the work as you know, right? 
to get from a 10 to a 5 is another universe from getting from a 5 to a 0. Or maybe I'm wrong. That's how I perceive it. Would you agree or disagree? I don't know because for – you know what? I think there are different ways to get there. I think the way I got there initially was actually similar to the way you're going about it. I, I didn't have, I didn't take any lessons. I basically just said, this is how I play golf. And I relied on athleticism, developed a basic course management strategy and just rolled with it. And that's how I, that's how I broke part of the first time and did that whole series that I did on my channel of like giving myself a 10 month challenge to do it. So I basically went about it the way you went about it. The only reason I've reinvented my whole self is that I realized in order for me to play in professional tournaments, even on like the Vancouver golf tour that we're part of and all that, like to play in those events, I saw what those players do and the day-to-day volatility. So you can be a scratch golfer and have the kind of day-to-day volatility that normal golfers go through. You know, you you shoot under par and then you can shoot 83. Like it Mm -hmm. it just happens. Mm -hmm when playing in these VGT events against these guys, that's just not an option. Right. And so I realized that like there, and I was talking to my coach about this this morning. Actually, it's funny. There are many different ways to play golf. There are very few ways to play pro golf. Right. And and, and I've learned that. So I think you can play scratch many different ways. And I think you with your self-awareness and just the amount of reps you get in, unintentionally because of the volume of golf you play out of joy could like sneakily just, you know, a little more like, like your, your maturity of the game will just continually get better. Cause you're, you're cerebral, you're smart. Like you can, I can tell by the way you think about it. It's just, you're not doing this passively, even though you are doing it out of joy and it is kind of passive. You're still not really that passive. Sure. Right. Like, otherwise you would make zero improvements, but you're just, you are making improvements. Like there is some thought, you know, it's, it's not totally just like go out there and shoot. Right. So I think like, because you have that self-awareness, maybe dialing in a couple things in like equipment or subtle tweaks and setup things like that. I don't know. I think there is a world where you could get down to low single digits for sure. Yeah, I think, yeah. I mean, the lowest I've been was like a 5.2 or 5.4, I think I'd have to look. And I do agree, like, I could, like, chisel away. It's nice to hear that you think it's possible. And I, I think it might be possible. But what's nice is, like, I would love to have that problem. I would love to have to change the name of the channel one time. Yeah. And again, bring this full circle. It's, like, so interesting. Like, for me, like, it's not even really on my radar. Like, do I want that to happen? Is that going to happen? Because it's no. just so separate from how I kind of think about the game. And that's... And that's great. And I think, and I, and I honestly, I think if it happens, it would be happening totally by accident. Like, yeah, I like agree. <laughs> it, it would be an, an, an accident in the sense of like, it's just the logical progression of compounding effort over time. Right. Right. It, it's just, you play X amount of rounds a year with this amount of strategy, you know, your game, you just keep refining those things. And then at some point, and it's also too, what I think interesting is watching is that people don't understand how handicaps work. Yeah. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Like like the fact that you're going to post an under par round as a 7, but then you can simultaneously post a 92 and people just kind of like this was one thing I ran into as my stuff started getting lower is that people just have no concept that like blow-ups exist at all ranges. Yeah. But then also really good days can exist at all ranges. Right. I I actually promised my viewers a long time ago I would make a video about the handicap system cuz the miss I don't mind criticism. I don't mind like anything in my YouTube comments. One thing that bothers me is like people, because my viewers are, a lot of them are like new to the game and trying to figure things out. So like having them be polluted by like misinformation is like the worst. And I just see so, so much misunderstanding of how the handicap system works. And I promised my viewers I would do a video on it. I haven't because I'm bad at making videos that aren't course vlogs. Sorry, we're sidetracked, but yeah, I just think it, it is, it's a really useful people for thing to, for people to understand because it will also help them realize like, oh, to become a single digit handicap doesn't mean I have to shoot 76 every day. That's like not how it works. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> and expectation management. Yeah, exactly. Right. Which goes back to also the ego thing that we talked about earlier. And this is where, again, like just kind of putting a bow on this is like, I, that's why I get, I like, I think your stuff is just so great. It's so light. Like your perspective on golf is amazing. I really enjoy it. I think no matter the level you're at, it's like the the lessons are universal. And I and I that's what I love about the game is that I I don't really I don't care what 
how anybody plays. I don't care what the handicap is. I really could give less of a shit. It's more about <laughs> like, I'm so fascinated by people's different mindsets, how they approach it, you know, how they think and how they navigate their way around the course. And, you know, there's, there's lessons to be learned at all levels from that. I, I'm on your wavelength and I appreciate all the kind words about the channel. Like I say, it's always surreal to me to hear like people are actually watching this stuff. So <laughs> Dude, it was a boy, treat to be you, on, man. You grew fast. Like your, your channel grew quick. Like you got yeah. viewership. That was another thing. Like you got viewership right away, which is cool. Yeah, something something definitely resonated, right? Like some, something clicked with something and the algorithm said we like this. And like I say, I'm just grateful every day that I can go out and be a handicapped golfer and indirectly get paid to play golf. <laughs> Sick. Well, guys, I have linked all of Adam's stuff in the description. Not a scratch golfer, potentially a scratch golfer in the future. <laughs> uh, give his stuff a follow. He's awesome. And stay tuned for his exciting special projects. If you guys are down in the US, PGA West, I heard that place is unreal. So stay tuned for Adam's meetup. This podcast is going live the same day as he's announcing this. So technically this is this is the unveiling this is phenomenal so anyway give, give him a follow give everything thank you guys so much for watching and we will catch you on the next one